Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Seated this evening will be Ryan Deasy, Chuck Sheehan, myself, Ben Philbrick, Fred Dykeman, and Lynn Conway. Our alternates who will be rotating in and out later on for various different reasons are Gary Belke and Andy Meek. I think our first uh, item on the agenda will be the minutes. We have two minute reports to approve. Make a motion to approve which which minutes are we at? Which date? Second. We'll do number seventeen hundred, July twenty second. Make a motion to approve the July twenty second minutes as written. Thank you, Ryan. We have a uh, second. Second, second. Mr. Chairman, that was July twenty sixth. July twenty sixth. Excuse me. Thank That's you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And now the seventeen oh one, August second. Make a motion to approve the August second minutes as written. Thank you, Ryan. Second, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chuck. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank I you. You will abstain. You will abstain. Thank you, Fred. That's correct. Uh, I guess we're moving right on to Keith. Sure. Before starting anything, I just want to point out for everyone here that if anyone's here for the public hearing item 7B on the agenda, um, that's the Mary Hall Road. Greenhaven Road uh, development by EG Home. That won't be taking place tonight. Um, they've asked that that hearing be opened and immediately continued to the September 20th meeting at this location. Um, what's that? Thank you. Oh, well. Uh, so what was the reason for that? Um, just to further modify the plans and react to comments from our department and from the town engineer. Okay, thank you. Uh, so item 5B are the administrative review items. 5B1 is 22187CON, M. Stem, and D. Levy, zoning permit application for the removal of invasive brush in a down tree in a non-infringement area. Property located at 112 Miss Tuxet Ave, Mystic, <coughs> Assessor's Map 162, Block 4, Lot 1, Zone RC 120. So, um, zoning permit application, um, it's for the removal of invasive brush in a down tree, in a non-infringement non area on a residential property. Um, the removal has already occurred. Um, the proposals located in the RC 120 zones, non-infringement area. Um, and in that zone, it's defined as an area where um, within 100 feet of water courses or wetlands, uh, you can't disturb, fill, or improve uh, any of the vegetation there. But with the commission's permission, um, you can use it for public trails, greenways, boat access, and water quality restoration activities. Um, removal of invasive species is commonly approved by this board as a water quality restoration activity due to the environmental benefits. Um, a recommended stipulation from the zoning official and, and wetland official is just that the recently cleared area adjacent to the cove shall be planted with upland plantings rather than grass. Um, there's a letter from the applicant in the report and different photos in, including a before and after photo there. Has grass already been planted, do you know? No. Okay. Do I hear a motion on this uh, situation? Make a motion to approve the application as submitted. Thank you, Ryan. Is there a uh, second? A second. Oh, thank you for that. With, with the stipulation. With, uh, with the stipulation from Pete, yes. Of not planning, yeah. Planning. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> We'll try to speak more clearly into the microphones. Okay, thank you. Um, for the two old business items, the two bond releases just recommend tabling until the next meeting, um, which just leads to the public hearings. All right, we will be continuing the town of Stonington's 
zoning regulation amendment. Um, I suppose for the record, Lynn, you should read it right from the top. Yeah. Please. And would you like me just to open the um, EG Home LLC just to have it opened and closed? Or have yeah, we already documented that? Yeah, that's a good idea before we forget. Okay, I'll do that first. Excuse me? Yes, Ben. I'd just like to suggest if the, that if the applicant isn't ready, why would you hurry over the I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Into the microphone, yeah. I'm just wondering why, if the applicant isn't prepared, why you open public hearings and start the clock. I think, I think, Keith, do you have more information on that? Well, it's just, you know, their right to, to do that. Um, Well, I mean, ultimately, if they run out of time and they're not ready, then they run out of time and it won't be approved. Uh, the Mary Hall Road. The question was, why are we going to open it to immediately postpone it? I think we're ready to move along. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Pursuant to the general statutes of the State of Connecticut revision of 1958 and all amendments thereto, and pursuant to the zoning regulations of the Town of Stonington, Connecticut, the Planning and Zoning Commission hereby gives notice that it will hold a public hearing at the Stonington Board of Education District Office, 40 Field Street, Pawcatuck, Connecticut, on Tuesday, August 16th, 2022 at 7 p.m. on the following applications. PZ2217SD and SUP Cherenzia Excavation Inc. and EG Home LLC. Subdivision and special use permit applications for modification of an approved re-subdivision plan consisting of 42 single-family homes within a common interest community on a single reconfigured lot. Property located on Mary Hall and Greenhaven Roads, Pawcatuck, Assessor's Map 7, Block 1, Lots 44 and 44F through 44L, Zone RM20. This is to be opened and it, it is now uh, going to be immediately continued to the next, or until September 20th, September 20th meeting. Thank you, Lynn. The next application, PZ2221RA, Town of Stonington, PZC, Zoning Regulation Amendment Application to Create Regulations for Cannabis Establishments in the community. This is continued from the 8 to 22 meeting. Thank you, Lynn. Um, the procedure, as always, will be there's a sign up sheet on the desk by the, I'll call it the front door, the front entryway. The applicant, this being Keith in the town, will have their first chance to present new information that we have from the last, that we did not have. On the last meeting, hence why we uh, are here tonight. The public will then have some time to have input in favor, against, general comments, rebuttal by the town in this case, staff input, board questions, and then we will close the meeting and hopefully vote on it this evening. Can you hear me all right out there? That's much better, actually. I can. I can Waving. Uh, you can welcome to sit up closer if you like. <laughs> Okay. Keith. Well, as you said, this hearing was initially uh, opened and discussed at the last meeting. Um, there were very, there were a lot of helpful comments from the commission and the public that went into the new modifications of the proposed regulation. Um, 
Excuse me, Keith. <laughs> Fred pointed out something. I'm embarrassed to say I never said who was seated. Okay. So, one moment, please. Seated for this meeting will be Ryan Deasy, Chuck Sheehan, myself, Ben Philbrick. Fred Dykeman was not here last meeting, so he will recuse himself, or not be involved. Lynn Conway, you were here, so you will be seated. And I thought I'd have Andy Meek. You were here at that last meeting. You'll be sitting on this decision. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Fred. You're welcome. Okay, Keith, sorry for the interruption. Oh, no problem. So, uh, starting from the beginning, um, some of the definitions are more uh, clarified than they were last time. Um, getting rid of the term person for these businesses and specifying that the department means the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection. Uh, one change that was talked about was not just allowing a cannabis retailer, but allowing a cannabis retailer or a cannabis hybrid retailer. So the limitation is still going to be just one of these things, but it's going to be one cannabis retailer or cannabis hybrid retailer. And a hybrid retailer is basically a retailer that can also do medical marijuana. But that would be, excuse me, Keith, that would be first come, first serve, whoever. Right, okay. yeah. And that change is reflected in the individual zones and in the use chart. But I do want to point out this is not what the town voted on. That is correct. Uh, the town didn't vote on specifics. The language the town voted on was just the question, shall the town of Stonington adopt an ordinance prohibiting the establishment of a cannabis establishment within the town limits? Um, so the specifics weren't in that. Um, the state law at the time was just that a town of our size could have one retailer and one microcultivator. So this zoning regulation does still stick with that, okay. even though it's not state law anymore. Uh, we talked about the distance requirements before. Um, the way it's worded in here is that there's a minimum distance requirement of 100 feet from any residential use or place of worship. Um, it didn't seem like there was a real consensus on changing things last time. So it's still listed as 100, although that was a point of interest last time. Keith, just out of curiosity, were you able to find anything about uh, the similar distances for liquor stores? Mm -hmm. I know we were looking um, at there, the Ryan? The state... Yeah, oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, the state does not have a specific distance requirement from liquor stores to churches or places of worship. Okay. Um, they said in their response that it could be a factor in approving a liquor permit or denying a liquor permit uh, in general, but there's not a specific distance requirement. Okay, thank you. And do, do our regulations have a distance requirement? No, we don't. Um, there's an updated section here about the odor control plans for cannabis microcultivators. Um, the language is more specific. Uh, it still requires an outside review by an expert. Um, more detail about the building being designed and equipped so that odors can't be detectable from the property line. Um, it also mentions that it should be continuously implemented by the applicant once it gets going, which is something we talked about here. Specifies that cannabis hybrid retailers, yeah, just includes them in the hours of operation. Uh, for the traffic and parking management, specifies that a traffic impact study is required. Um, for the Maritime Heritage District where Mystic Seaport is, it specifically says now that cannabis establishments shall not be permitted in that district. It also specifies that in the... Uh, MDD, Neighborhood Development District, that it's only cannabis, 
Cannabis establishments can only be allowed there when the previous zone is HI-60 or TC-80. And it can only be the types of cannabis establishments that are allowed in those districts. The idea being they're allowed in the TC-80 and HI-60 anyway, so um, people don't get penalized by using the NDD in those zones only. Now, in one of the things we talked about was the distance requirement. Um, one of the things I tried to do was spell that out a bit. Um, so in, in the report on page 32, um, there's a map there of, of residential uses in and adjacent to the HI-60 zone. Um, and the point of this is just to show that if those distance requirements get too big, potential businesses will be bumping into residential uses nearby. Um, so that 100 foot minimum distance requirement could be increased somewhat, you know, maybe 200, 250 or so, but once you start getting above that, it becomes difficult to cite things in that zone. And I focused on the HI-60 because it's, um, between this and the TC-80, this is the zone where there's a lot more developable land TC-80 is possible, but it might be harder to, to cite something. But, it's, but it can happen. It could, yeah. Um, there's also a map up in here of an existing church in the HI-60 zone on Liberty Street and a thousand foot radius from that because a thousand feet was sort of mentioned at some level as a possibility. Um, and this map shows that a thousand feet from that church does sort of take a lot of areas off the table in that zone. Um, if you're interested in some real deep dives, you know, I included a link to some existing uh, odor studies by the applicant and by the outside expert for other towns, um, which are very detailed and sort of brings, brings home the point that you really do need the outside expert to review these things. And we didn't receive any other comments from other outside agencies or anything like, like that in this time. Okay, is uh, anybody from the public would like to have an input on this? Any comments? Sure. <clears throat> For the record, my name is Carlene Donna Rumo. I live in Pawkatuck. While I agree with most of uh, Keith's green highlighted additions to the proposed cannabis regulations, I still have some reservations or, and concerns about three things. One, the addition of the words, quote, cannabis hybrid retailer, end quote, which appears in several sections. While I agree that a medical dispensary is a good idea, it is not what was voted on by the townspeople. I am sure I do not have to remind you that we voted, what we voted on was one cannabis retailer and one microbrewer, which was what the state offered at the time that we voted. And I believe that was confirmed by Mr. Brines just recently. Also, I believe a cannabis hybrid realtor is not what Mrs. Mayhar was describing, where she is the pharmacist in charge in Groton, where she works. She did not mention any regular sales of cannabis to anyone, only those which had a medical, med, only those which are medically ordered by a doctor. Perhaps at some future date, a medical dispensary could be added to our regulations. 
If I had to state why people in our town voted the way they did, it was for two reasons. One, the money that would come to our town from the fees, and two, they wanted to buy cannabis for recreational use. And if you remember, it was a very unusual statement that we voted on. It was, if you were in agreement, it was the opposite. Yes or no, it was the opposite of what was stated. It was very confusing. But anyway, again, I think a medical dispensary could be added to the regulations later. I strongly suggest that all references to a cannabis hybrid retailer be eliminated from the proposed regulations under consideration tonight. Number two, why is that there? If, I, if you agree that this is the time that a hybrid retailer should be eliminated, then section 6.6.27.4.2 should be eliminated from the regulations. And three, personally, I never liked the Ellen NDD regulations and feel that they should have been stricken from our regulations. If these regulations are staying, I wonder how likely it is that a parcel, an HI-60 zone or the TC-80 zone would be rezoned to NDD. Would the ultimate goal of these regulations stated in 7.21.1.1 as requiring, quote, assurances for the town and its residents that its existence and future plans will enhance and not disturb the surrounding residential neighborhood. Would that be accomplished? In addition, I find 7.21.6.4.7 very confusing, especially the phrase that reads, and I'm going to read it to you which may be permitted the specific types of cannabis establishments that are allowed to have in those districts, end quote. That phrase doesn't sound grammatically correct to me. I think you should uh, correct it. Well, those are my comments after my lengthy comments the first time around. Thank you for considering them. Uh, Thank be you. Before you go, uh, could sure. I... Could I ask you to elaborate on how you perceive the difference between a hybrid retailer and just a purely recreational retailer? Okay, I believe if you look at the definition, the hybrid person or business or establishment would be dispensing not only medically documented cannabis for the person, but also to any Joe Blow who walks into the, the institution. And right. that is not what is in Groton. Correct. Okay. I'm just curious, um, you were saying it's not what we voted on. Right. I'm just not sure how adding, I, I, I'm just trying to follow how adding the medical dispensary to the same facility that is already there to sell recreationally what, what, what we had originally at the last meeting was all of these proposals to allow a dispensary. And now we're talking about changing that to allow a dispensary or a hybrid dispensary. Yeah, that's if you decide to vote that way. Right. 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 I disagree. Okay. I think we should just have the retail, which with, I think most people <coughs> voted on it for. They, I don't think they even heard the word medical dispensary before now. And by the amount of people who are here, the number of people, I should say, who are here, I guess people just don't care or aren't interested in what's going on. I don't know. It's up to you to decide for the town. And I'm just giving you some points that I think you should consider. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> no, that was it. Thank you. Mr. Tamsky. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just two quick points. Um, thank you. Thank you for your homework. 
I'll wait. I'll wait for Carly. Yeah, I will leave in a minute. Don't want you to leave, Carly. <laughs> Thank you, Carly. Thank you. Thank you. What's going on over there? Just a, a couple of quick points. Um, one is uh, the reference to hours of operation. Um, I'm just wondering. I, I don't. As far as I'm, as far as I know, that's not something that exists anywhere else in our regulations uh, for any other use. Um, liquor stores are regulated. The hours are regulated by the state, I believe, not by zoning regulation. Um, so I, I don't see the, the need for that in the regulation. I think it. Whatever, um, whatever uh, restrictions the state puts on it, as far as hours of operation, should be should be adequate. I would think. Um, I think you might be st starting a precedent by putting hours of operation into a use in your regulations. Um, second of all, with regard to the distance requirements, I um, I understand the the idea of keeping. Um, uses separate and with regard to the residential uses I just think um, you should be careful that you don't make them too onerous otherwise I think this is all going to become an academic experience uh, experience and there won't be anywhere that one of these facilities can be built because it's going to be just it just won't exist on the map um, and with regard to Carlene's comments about the hybrid facility I I understand what she's saying, but I think that the hybrid is uh, actually less intensive or less, uh, should be less troublesome as far as most people would be concerned, I think, because there's a, there's a higher level of uh, regulation and scrutiny on the medical side, the dispensary sides, and if you're only adding that to, to an already um, approved recreational dispensary, I don't see the problem with that. Um, other than that, just thanks for doing great work on this. I think everybody contributed a lot. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Any other comments from the public? Keith, do you have a rebuttal? Um, as I said, you know, the town vote was <clears throat> was general about whether to prohibit cannabis establishments in the town and I don't think having the hybrid as an option as a type of retail um, goes beyond that because there's still just going to be a maximum of one either retailer or hybrid um, and the hybrid just adds the possibility of selling uh, medical also um, as Mr. Tamsky pointed out, there is that extra oversight, as the as the speaker at the last meeting said. Um, of the NDD reg here, it the wording is confusing until you look at the section on top, which says prohibited uses shall include, and then it, when you read that, it makes grammatical sense. Um, and the, the cannabis statute does specifically say that uh, towns can limit the hours of these cannabis establishments. So it is a little bit more authority than you, than you normally have with uses in town. Whereas we cannot regulate liquor store hours, correct? Yeah, that is a state. That is a state Thing. So the state's allowing the town to set its own regulations. Of yeah. Hours of Kate, does, it, does the state have any recommendations for hours on their own for cannabis establishments? No, no, no. they don't have any. And the regu the hours in the um, proposed regulation here for cannabis are the same as the ones for for liquor stores. Okay, thank you, Keith. Would there be any? Uh, you know, I. I I sort of liked what was said about, you know, not stipulating hours in a regulation, but there would be nothing that would prevent us from stipulating hours of operation in a permit, correct? And I mean, and that, that could, 
that could vary based on the location that's proposed. Right. And you right. might want that flexibility based on on the location. And that's what I'm thinking of with the comment that, that was raised that, that we might want to leave some flexibility in this uh, depending on the actual location that, that uh, is proposed. So if, if we could stipulate in a permit hours of operation because the statute gives us that authority, uh, we would want to stipulate in the permit the hours of operation. Rather than these regs. It, uh, rather than adopt a rigid criteria that would allow them to operate in that bandwidth, uh, you know, that maybe isn't ideal based on the specific application that comes in. Other board members, what do you guys think? I think Chuck's got a good point. Yeah, agreed. So would we write that into this regulation so that it's very clear to future boards that the hours of opera operation be will be part of the permitting <coughs> process yeah. and should be covered. I like that. As yeah. Should be covered at as that time. We stipulated okay. the permit. Yeah. By the board. Yeah. I, I like that. And do you on board like that? I'm on board. Right. Yes, I'm on board. Okay. So I, I have a number of questions. You know, I did, did a little homework over the last uh, couple of weeks. And I, Keith, my understanding is that in New York State, the state has said very clearly that if a town votes to go forward with saying you can have an establishment, that 1, 10, 20, whatever it is, they cannot then five years from now say, change that vote and say, no, we no longer want to have these type of establishments, um, and that's by state law. Is that your understanding for Connecticut? Has there been anything like that stated? No, I mean, the town did away with the, the limitation on towns based on population. So, um, but, but did... But it's specifically stated that if, I want to make, make my felt, myself very clear, that if a town has voted to say, we will allow retailers, cultivators, whatever it is they voted for, and they said yes, all right, with or without a number, yes, they cannot go back five years later and say, we want to change this now to no based on whatever happens in the town. Maybe they have a bad experience, I, don't, I have no idea. But is that part of the Connecticut law? No, I don't think there's anything like that in the Connecticut law. Okay, because it's specific, specifically. It'd be, it'd be up to the town, to have, it'd be up to the board to allow another one. Right, but in New York that's not the way it is, so I want to be sure I understood. Okay, um, the second question I have, um, has to do with the NDD zone. So I'm kind of getting to the public comment about um, the fact that the NDD zones um, say that we, we, the town has to ensure that there would be no dis disturbance and, in fact, an enhancement to the neighborhood. Now, given the changes in the state statutes where we no longer allowed to say uh, for any kind of a permit, uh, permit or application that it has to be in keeping with the neighborhood. That language is Correct. no longer allowed. Yeah. How is that handled for the NDD? So in other words, is that going to go away because the state has said it has to go away, or no, because that is a specific zone and we have specific language that it would it would stay that way and that would therefore be a consideration if a permit was required for that. Yep. You know, the floating zones like the NDD are, are a different animal where the commission has a lot more discretion because the people are coming to you asking for a zone change. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like when someone comes to you asking for, let's say, a regulation amendment. I want to allow uh, dog daycares in this zone. The commission's at its maximum level of discretion to say, no, we don't think that's a good idea. No, thank you. And that's sort of the same thing with 
with this, the floating zones like the NDD, where if you think something doesn't live up to its statement of purpose there, which includes a language of, you know, making the neighborhood in the area better, mm -hmm. then you're definitely within your rights to say no. Okay, okay. I just wanted to be sure. Can, that I, ask, can I ask a follow-up question to Lynn's? Uh, just I'm curious, though, because that whole, the, with the state saying you can't have, the, does that put us in conflict with the state law at all? I'm just curious. No, because the state, the change to the state law was just about using the vague term character, uh, character of the neighborhood to deny things. Okay. Um, especially housing applications. Um, you know, and that would often be the case where you know, uh, neighbors would protest housing developments and the commission would say, we don't think it meets the character of the neighborhood with nothing to really back it up in the zoning regulations. So that's the type of thing that's now spelled out in state law that you can't do. You can't just rely on that vague notion of community character. Okay, so our NDD being more specifically defined yeah, place. yeah, and because it's an actual zone change, okay. it's more than just a regular old development application. Okay, thank you. So then my next question has to do with some of the definitions, and I'm looking specifically at 5.2.2 and the table that you put together, which, I'm sorry, uh, the public may not have um, access to this at the moment. Um, so we've got various uses listed and there's more than two types of uses and I I just again I want the regulations to be very clear later on for future boards a cannabis micro cultivator you could have one or you could have two and that would be it for the whole town is that um, correct? Just, just one in the whole just town. Just one. You could have a cannabis micro cultivator and a cannabis product manufacturer, one in one, and then no retailer, or like, is there, you can have one of these three and one of these three, but you can't have a combo with these definitions? I don't think it's clear, is my, my point. I mean, you could have a combo as long as the thing is allowed in that zone. So the only real limit you, is... So you're saying you could have a, a cannabis micro cultivator, a cannabis product manufacturer, and a cannabis product packager, and, 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 and cannabis food and beverage manufacturer. That, that would count as one if it was all in the same facility, and then you, if you had another facility, you could have the cannabis retailer, and if we go for, forward with retailer and hybrid retailer. Is that, is that, it's the way the table is written. It, I'm just not sure if it's clearly, the, we have clarity as to the column of use is different because you've got a number of columns of use versus one retailer, one cultivator. Because yeah. it seems to me like you've got a lot of things written here. You've got like eight. So I don't know if for clarity's sake, blocking them off, um, or in some in the definition you want to say a cultivator is one but not more than one of the following. And a retailer is one, but not more than one of the following, right? Or stipulate that you can't combine the uses on a site. Correct. Yeah. That'd be right. another way to do it. That's, yeah. that's yeah. another way to do it. But this table doesn't work. Maybe just an asterisk and say stipulate that you can't combine uses on a single site. Is, that is true? there is there a, in general is there an issue with combining some of these uses? Like if there's a micro cultivator that also does packaging or manufacturing, is that something we wouldn't want? I mean, I could see some of it makes sense that you would have some of those. You know, uh -huh. Micro cultivator would also probably have a packaging operation. I guess uh, to your point, I guess we need some clarity on this table, like linking them. 
Yeah, I don't know. And I, I think it's um, unfortunate that the vote, um, the way the vote was stated was very <laughs> ambiguous at best. Extremely. But he needs a, a lesson in English. But um, it's, it's certainly, we are not doing ourselves any favors by having a regulation that's this confusing. So I, I just think we need to hone in on what we think needs to be done here and the language. I agree well, wholeheartedly with that. That's that's exactly the kind of question that's gonna come up to yeah, the zoning, 10 years from now the zoning enforcement up. officer. Right. You know, somebody's gonna that's the, the first thing that's gonna come out of the gate is something exactly like that. Mm -hmm. There's so I, I think stipulating it in the regulation is a good is a good item. Well it is listed in section six six twenty seven five of the regulation. That's where it says the commission may only approve a maximum of either one cannabis retailer slash hybrid retailer and one cannabis micro cultivator in the town. The use chart is just a sum summary of where things are allowed. So there are dozens and dozens of rules that are not mentioned in the use chart because it's just a summary. Um, the definition, ideally the definitions are definitions and don't contain actual rules because that adds to its own confusion when there are rules sort of hidden in the in the definitions of zoning. Um, okay, so in so my opinion, the use chart doesn't have to spell out that limitation. That's a rule that's just mentioned elsewhere. And down the road, let's say we say, hey, these uh, cannabis retailers are a good thing. We could change that rule, allow more. But I don't, I don't think it needs to be mentioned in the use chart. Well, then the use chart has this cannabis delivery service and or transporter. And the zones that that's allowed for do not match one-on-one -on -one the zones for any of the others. So is it incorporated? It, was that just an error? Uh, so you've got the, C, uh, the GC60 zone allowing the cannabis delivery service and or transporter. That is not allowed. No other definition of activity is allowed in the GC60 zone. So then would that say, okay, if I have um, a cannabis delivery service and or transporter, I put it in the GC60, what box does that check? The retailer or the cultivator? None. There's no, the only ones that are limited to only one in town are the retailer slash hybrid retailer or micro cultivator. So in theory, you could have five cannabis product packagers in town. Okay, did anybody else get that from reading this? No, no. Okay, <laughs> so we have a problem, right? Yeah. So it seems like there's been this expectation kind of implicitly set in the discussions that what we're discussing is allowing one retailer and one micro cultivator. Could we perhaps amend the language to say something like, we will allow, because you know, the people voted on a dispensary. They said, we shall not stand in the way of that, mm -hmm. basically, with the language used. So that was kind of given the go-ahead by that referendum. Could we say that we will allow one retailer and then one period of any of the other uses? So, or, say the first person to come is a delivery service, then we don't have a cultivator. That would fill that second slot. That's, that's what I think, actually, the town voted on, and I agree with you. I just don't think it's clear. No, no, I see what you're saying, and, and right now it's not clear, but I think that if we were to say that we were allowing one retailer, one, you know, and then all of the other uses, get kind of lumped together. Yeah, as one. As one, which there can be one of. Right, That's what called which well, is people different did, from what Keith just said. Right. 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 right, but if people did read the state law back then, they would have seen that the limit was for one retailer and one microcultivator without limits on the other ones. That, that was the state statute at that time. The state statute at that time. Which was not referenced in our referendum. No. Who put that together? So I think that assuming that people out there thought that we were only going to allow one establishment is sort of overreaching what people were thinking. 
Well, the, the press was lumping in the state statute with our vote and not necessarily that was the case. So I, I, w I really like Andy's proposal yeah. as a start, Agreed. right? And then if we have misinterpreted what the town thought, I'm sure we'll hear about it and we can go back and amend it and expand. I don't think we should assume that everyone read the state statute verbatim and interpreted the way some people have. So I think I'd like to propose that we we do exactly what Andy has stated, but we state it very clearly in here because I, I just don't think it's there. Makes sense. Yeah, and there's another thing. Yeah, I, I, agree. I agree completely with Lynn. Yeah. And with Andy. I think I think he, yeah. the way you stipulated it was very clear. Okay. And somehow that should be memorialized. So if you could repeat it, Andy, that'd be great. Oh. <laughs> there are another thing is these these uses are different license types that are in the state statute. I'm not expert enough to know if a microcultivator will typically also get a manufacturer's license and a packager license and a delivery license. So if we're sort of, if we're just limiting it to one of those, period, then, you know, we might not get the typical microcultivator if they typically do those other things too. So maybe this is, I, I know we're under a little bit of a time, time. I, again, I think we go conservative because we can always expand. And if even a month from now, we right. do a little bit of homework, you know, I think, and come back and, and amend, I think that would be better than A, having a gap, right, in our timelines, and B, being wrong. So, or opening the door wider than, than I think, uh, you know, some people may have interpreted when they voted in the referendum. Right. I, exactly. You know, I, uh, at least at least one person that pays close attention to things here in town uh, thinks that that the referendum, you know, was very clear and, and stated, you know, was limited and. Uh, you know, there's nothing from stopping us from expanding this if everything works out and there's a basis for expanding it. So I do agree strongly with you, Lynn, that, that uh, Andy's stipulation is a good starting point, mm -hmm. and uh, and it doesn't doesn't prohibit us from uh, expanding it later on. Okay. All right. If every micro cultivator that comes to us says, "I've got these other licenses," this town is not suitable then we'll get the drift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it makes sense to proceed with Andy's recommendation. Great. So then my, my other comment is really about um, the 100 foot versus the 1,000 foot. And I, I don't know what's right. But what I heard in the last meeting about the lines right wrapping around buildings four times etc i did go out and talk to people and um that is truly a fact in some towns and the time that it changed is when multiple retailers started getting permits for the town so I, again i I mean, a thousand feet seems it's bigger than a football field, right? So that's that's a lot. Yeah, it's three but on the other it, hand, yeah. right? But on the other hand, um, you know, um, I, a hundred feet. If the line is, I was thinking two hundred and fifty feet. Good catch. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then do you put something along the parking? So is it 250 feet and they're on the sidewalk? Is it 250 feet and they're on somebody's grass? Is it 250 feet and everybody's, you know, trying to come up with where they're parking their car while they're waiting? Because, you know, I don't know. And I know the traffic study is part of that. Um, I think that'll be handled in the special use permit. You know, where do you plan on having... Right. The waiting lines. Yeah. Yeah. But, it's that traffic and parking say, management plan. 
So then it's but going to be foot, foot traffic what are plan. what so then the traffic plan is going to have to say well based on I don't know um, Stockbridge Massachusetts right. right they in this retailer they have you know 20 people every every hour I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea but you would have to know that Stockbridge, Massachusetts, just as a made-up example, I have no idea, has 10 retailers. Well, in five years, we might. Right, and we could. So. But I, I'm a little worried about that. I'm a little worried, is the traffic um, that we're going to require, they get an independent traffic study, but is there something else we need to say um, from a from a town that has the same regulations or only has one and one, and then again, if we up it and all of a sudden we have five, we can up that section as well of um, the regulation. Well, why not stipulate having a foot traffic study? I mean, we have a traffic well, study. Why not have? You know, the regulation asks for a traffic and parking management plan. One of the things that talks about as addressing um, outdoor pedestrian queuing areas in addition to things like overflow parking areas, heavy customer traffic, traffic management measures, planned police traffic details, loading and deliveries. So the idea of the plan is to account for all those things, not just traffic. typical traffic at intersections, but what are you going to do with all these people? What are you going to do if there's just not enough room in your parking lot? and you need to find mm -hmm. some other options. How are you going to work with the police to deal with this? Okay. So you're thinking we've covered it? I think we've covered it there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Especially because, you know, that's kind of hard to write out in the regulation, just that sort of basic fact that if one opens in this town and there's not a lot in the region yet, it'll be busy, and eventually as time goes on, it'll sort of peter out as it spreads out to the other areas. Um, and a lot of times that's the same phenomenon you might see with donut shops or, you know, other, other new retail things in the area that are okay. popular. Okay. So let me just ask you a question. How many people can stand in line in 100 feet? <laughs> <laughs> well, you Depends know. on what COVID standard. Right. <laughs> and how much they like each other. What's the social distancing? Yeah, really. Yeah. So I just said, on your foot thing, I'm just a little worried about it in the residential area. I'm, yeah, I'm that's not valid, sure that's enough. Yeah, valid concern. So if we, yeah, I know. So do we want to agree on 250 feet? Is that? I'm, I'm Is agreeable this to 250. 250 feet from residences or 250 from places of worship that we're talking um, about? Both. I feel like I understand the 250 from residential. I'm not sure I see the need for the place of worship, um, just because you know we're we're looking at this one church in, in the HI60 as the example for that, and it may well be the only instance of it in the zones that we're permitting, um, and that is on such a busy road mm -hmm. that I don't think that the increase in traffic or activity in their vicinity from a, a new dispensary would even equal the shadow of beach traffic. Oh, really? I don't, I, I don't know what I, I'm just not sure that it would be an appreciable difference in that particular location. Having a footage requirement? Right, for the place of worship. But I, I can understand the residential um, expansion to 250 feet. Anyone else? Do you re really want to have three different because it's a thousand feet from schools, nursery schools, and dependency centers. I think I think that's how it was worded. I think 250 feet for both residential and places of worship makes sense. I mean, I, think, I do as well. I, I think the the sensitivities of of both uses are similar. Yeah, agreed. Then? Yeah, I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah. Okay. If everybody else is okay with it, I won't make a stink. Okay. I think it's 250. <laughs> yes, Ben, did you have a question? I wanted to address the discussion about the view table and the natural view. I think that's a 
Can, can you please use the microphone, Ben? Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think there was new information brought up when you were discussing the use table and also 6.6.27.5. Um, um, or at least many of us were confused originally, I think. And I, it seems that originally we were, we were talking about one microcultivator and one retail establishment. Now I'm not sure if we're talking about one microcultivator or one retail establishment, um, let alone whether the other uses that were not discussed uh, I are limited to one or not. And I think, that, I think that the understanding during the referendum was that because the way the state law was written, that there would be allowed one microcultivator and one retailer. And I think, I think that to limit anything, limit to anything less than that would, would definitely go against what was voted on in the referendum because that was something that was, was um, clearly uh, enabled by the by the state legislation. Uh, to be clear, what I was proposing earlier was that rather than saying there can be one retailer and one cultivator, I was saying perhaps we specify there can be one retailer and one of any of the other uses. So whether that be a cultivator. But the total is two, right? That's okay. It. As long as the total is two, but I still I would still go back to what Keith said. Um, that the referendum and the and the legi the state uh, legislation didn't really address the other uses. Um, you know the delivery service and the manufacturers. Excuse me, the town's referendum or the state statute? What do well, you both. I don't. Not, neither were really addressed. Well, the referendum didn't mention any number. No, the, the, it didn't. And Keith, it, it, Keith just read the referendum. No, I understand that. And the referendum strictly said that we but wouldn't. We wouldn't. But I will agree, the town's people at that time, myself included, based it on the state's statute of the moment. Right, right. As, right. as the best we can what's understand. What's so confusing is the moment has changed, <laughs> the state statute's changed, but we haven't changed I understand. our I just thinking. think that to, to go with anything less than one and one would be, would be against the referendum. That's, so that's, that's what we're saying. That's one what we're one, which that's is exactly what, what you're saying, I think. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, Carleen. <laughs> Um, Carlene Donagumo. Mr. Sheehan mentioned um, putting something in the chart, and I'm just wondering if you would consider or if would solve the problem, because a lot of those zones had all ends, right. okay? But the ends, but the other, some of the other zones have a lot of S's in them. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and the dilemma is, what are we gonna do? Right. So I would suggest, and you please think about putting an asterisk on the column and define underneath that only one of these is allowed in this zone. And then a double asterisk to the second one, only one of these is allowed in this zone. Maybe that'll solve the problem. Do you think it might? Yeah, I, I think it should be stated at kind of as a bullet, right? Bullet and then a sub bullet, right? <laughs> and then the chart updated accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's just so, a suggestion. We've done charts before with asterisks in them. Yeah. Duly noted. Yeah. This is Thank you. Where you might want to put it. <laughs> yeah. It does need clarity. Thank you. Keith, have any other ideas or? Put I'm just sort of adding up the changes here. Please. All 
All right, well, the two major ones are um, changing, seven, six, six, changing section 6622, excuse me, 6627.2, yep. point two, yep. to say that it should be 250 feet from any residential use or place of worship. Agreed. Agreed. The other change was to amend 6627.5 to say the commission may only approve a maximum of either one cannabis retailer slash hybrid retailer and one of either cannabis microcultivator, delivery service, transporter, food and beverage manufacturer, product manufacturer, or product packager. For a total of two. Yeah, I yeah. Yeah. Within the two. entire town. With the entire, yeah. Right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Good for What's the matter, Dan? <laughs> since you're on 6.6.27.5, Point two, I think that sentence, the commission may only approve a maximum of either one cannabis retailer, hybrid retailer, and one cannabis multi micro cultivator in the town. I think that either doesn't belong there. It makes it sound like either, either a retailer or oh, a yeah. micro cultivator. No, you're right. Either you're you're absolutely different. right. That's why I was confused. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. No, you're absolutely right. Thank you, ben. Got that, Keith? Yeah. And let's see. Hours. As far as the use chart. Two, two. So, Keith, you're going to go through each one of the zones and just make sure that where you said cannabis establishment, you're making it, it's, it's very clear, right? I'm just going to use the same statement, 10, over and over again. Okay. Yeah, like for the language of the different zones, like when you look at GC60, yeah, yeah I'll have to add something in there. And then I, I just I, I've never seen this in a, um, a regulation, the benefit and risk of the cannabis establishments. Why, why would that be in the regulation at all? Oh, it's, it's not. It's just uh, no, it's part, of his part of the report. It's just part of the report. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I just um, wanted to be sure. Hours? Do we need to talk about the hours? hours. Oh, right. Hours. Just before we leave the table. Yes. Would it, I understand that the table is not the rule, it's the definition here. But would it make sense to add some clarity to divide the uses into two categories? So we had use category A, which would include yes. the first one, two, three, right. eight. And then use category B, which would be the retailer slash hybrid. And then we say we can allow one from use category A, and we can allow one from use category B. That's right. another way to do it. Yeah. Right. Nobody so want to slice a this bullet apple. and then a simple. Yep, whatever, exactly. Yep. Whatever makes sense. <laughs> yeah. That's another good way to do it. Yeah. You're full of ideas tonight, Andy. <laughs> yeah. And how do you want the wordage for the hours to be determined at the special use permit mm -hmm. meeting? On the hours, of, uh, yeah. Yeah. hours of operation shall be stipulated during the permit process. Yeah. yeah. Agreed? Yes. Okay. Agreed. Right. Any other? Any other comments? Carrie, you have any other input? No. Okay. Make
make a motion to approve uh, the regulation uh, as written and amended to have close the public hearing. Oh, close public hearing. Sorry. Make a motion to close public hearing. Thank you. Ryan. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 We have three votes. Okay. Right. POCD, comprehensive plan, and the regulations as amended. Okay. Make a motion to approve the POCD uh, as proposed and written. Second. Okay. Thank you. Chuck and Ryan, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. And then the next one, make a motion to approve. I didn't catch that second one. Comprehensive plan? Of comprehensive plan. Make a motion to approve the comprehensive plan as written. Well, it's conformance to the comprehensive oh, plan. conformance to. Thank you, Ryan. Do we hear a second? Second. Thank you, Chuck. Discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And then make a motion to approve the regulations as written and amended uh, with the items that we discussed, uh, one, four items and changes that we discussed in this meeting. Except is that what you have, Keith? Four? I got one, two, four, two, three, four. Maybe we should read those out. I think I got five. One was um, the change to 66275, which was right. limiting the types yeah. of uses. Right. And the second was 250 feet. Yeah, 250 feet. The right. use store changes. And then the hours being defined in the permit. Yeah, the, I just had them as separate things, you know, changing the language in each oh, zone. Okay. I had one. Add a note about the limit. Number four, I had amending the use chart to talk about the limit. Okay. I and, had the use chart combined, but then with the five, yeah. with the five recommended mm -hmm. stipulations and changes that we discussed, this key just. Outlined. So that's the motion. Second, Chuck. Second, Chuck. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Thank you, everybody. And the effective date of this regulation is. <coughs> September 5th. Shall we move on? Let's move on. Thank you. Okay. PZ2223SD and CAM, Mason's Island Company, Prominent Development, Subdivision and Coastal Area Management Review Applications for an 11 lot residential re subdivision. Property located on Schoolhouse and Cormorant Roads. Mystic Assessor's Map 181 Block 3 Lot 1 Zone RM15. Thank you, Lynn. So, seated this evening for this public hearing will be Ryan Deasy, Chuck Sheehan, myself, Ben Philbrick. Fred Dykeman has recused himself and is sitting in the audience, I believe. Lynn Conway and the alternate will be Gary. Thank you. Um, I think I've already stipulated the uh, ground rules. There should be a sign-up sheet by the door. Applicant, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, uh, for the record, I'm actually going to take this off the stand if that's okay. Uh, for the record, my name is Norm Tebow, uh, Killingly Engineering Associates. I'm here representing the applicant this evening. Um, we are proposing a uh, an 11 lot subdivision uh, that'll be. Uh, uh, 10 uh, residential lots and one open space lot. It's a, yes, sir. Uh, trying to see the best way. Maybe over here. That, if I'm going to walk around with the microphone, I guess that would be okay. I'll turn it a little bit here. Uh, so uh, this property is uh, is bounded by uh, Cormorant Road on the east, uh, North Road on the north, uh, Quarry Road on the west, and uh, Schoolhouse Road uh, on the south. Um, 
It's a 17 acre parcel. As I said, we are proposing 4.4 uh, acres of that property uh, to be put into uh, open space. And uh, the remaining lots are all over one acre in size. Uh, there will be nine lots uh, that will be accessed from a proposed uh, new private roadway that we're calling Kingfisher Way. Uh, the uh, eastern end of Kingfisher Way will uh, come off of Cormorant Road and then it terminates uh, to, the, uh, to the south and west on, uh, on Schoolhouse Road. One lot, which is uh, lot number 6-14, uh, will actually be um, accessed uh, from Schoolhouse Road. Um, in 2004, this property was approved for a 21 lot subdivision. Uh, subsequently, uh, the plans were never filed on the land records and uh, that uh, subdivision expired. So the, uh, we're here before you now uh, to reduce the number from 21 to 10 lots. And um, um, hopefully the uh, commission will look favorably upon this lesser um, intrusive, lesser, lesser of a concentration of housing on this particular site. Um, what we're showing here, the, uh, the sort of like orangey um, uh, houses, our, our, our proposed new houses, we're showing uh, paved driveways, on-site septic systems, the, uh, the uh, property will be served uh, by public water. Uh, the nine homes uh, that will be accessed from Kingfisher Way are from Aquarian Water. Uh, there's actually a, a, a Connecticut Water actually has a jurisdiction over, over Schoolhouse Road. So we've got two separate water companies that have jurisdiction over this. The, uh, the limit to the, um, to the Aquarian Water uh, company service is, is about right about at this point at Kingfisher at Kingfisher Way. So um, uh, Connecticut Water takes jurisdiction over that. We had a we had originally shown uh, a looped water line uh, that that would uh, come off of Cormorant Road and loop back to Schoolhouse Road, but neither company uh, was interested in uh, sharing the responsibility for that. So um, uh, instead, we'll terminate it. Uh, on Kingfisher Way, uh, Aquarian Water uh, will serve these lots and we have just a single service off of uh, uh, Schoolhouse Road. We did receive um, approval from the Inland Wetlands Commission uh, for this project on July 7th uh, with the stipulation that an invasive control plan be, be um, produced and, uh, and provided for the Town Engineers Review. Uh, that would be for the, uh, for the open space area because uh, a lot of that area uh, is, is being consumed uh, with invasive spe species uh, such as um, you know, bittersweet, honeysuckle, phragmites, mugwort, Japanese barberry, all of these types of things that uh, we typically don't like to see. Um, the, we do have approval uh, from uh, Ledgelite Health Department uh, for the subdivision review with the stipulation that individual site plans are required for each lot. Um, as you know, uh, for the subdivision review, all we have to do to, uh, for the health department is to demonstrate that uh, these lots uh, are capable of, of supporting an on-site septic system, uh, which they are. Uh, and typically a well also, but uh, as, as I uh, stated previously, the um, uh, water is gonna be a public water supply, so therefore uh, no wells are required. And we've also received a um, positive forwarding uh, from uh, the Conservation Commission, uh, a positive forwarding from the, uh, and from the Police Commission as well. Uh, they feel as though these, this is not um, uh, going to cause any undue uh, traffic management issues here. I, I do have review comments uh, from town staff uh, that I'd like to go over on these plans. Actually, let me just kind of go over what we're, as far as stormwater goes. Um, as part of the original subdivision of uh, Cormorant Road, uh, there was a, a stormwater basin uh, that was constructed. Uh, 
the Mason Island Homestead Homeowners Association has a stormwater basin in this area here. Uh, and there's also uh, an easement uh, to discharge uh, from this development uh, to that stormwater basement. Uh, the, um, uh, a, a good portion of the pipe has already been installed within that. There are, there are two, uh, two drainage manholes and, and the pipe that extends um, back toward this division, uh, this subdivision. Uh, so um, our low point in the road uh, is, is uh, approximately where uh, this pipe actually comes in. So we'll be able to tie our drainage system into that uh, existing uh, stormwater basin. Uh, for the, the high point of the, of the uh, property is right about where, where, you kinda, where you see Kingfisher here, where the K is, there's the high point in water. Uh, any storm water that falls on the road in this area uh, drains back toward uh, Schoolhouse Road. What we've done here is we've uh, cross-sloped the road uh, toward the open space. Uh, we have a water quality swale along the side of the road that will, that will collect the water. Um, the town engineer has uh, some comments on that, which I will go over um, afterwards. Um, and uh, as I said, um, these, uh, these single-family lots will be uh, an acre or more in size. And I think it's really apparent if you take a look at this overall aerial photograph that we have the, um, uh, the lots superimposed in red over the top of this. And uh, if you look at it in comparison to a lot of the lots that are around it, these are, are uh, substantially larger. And they are obviously substantially larger than what was approved previously in 2004. The, uh, the drainage from the site uh, is essentially the, um, the roadway uh, sort of acts as the high point. Um, where you've got uh, you've got water uh, discharged, uh, flowing in two directions, sort of radially, uh, from the high point where the road is. Uh, we are collecting it in that co in that closed uh, drainage system and conveying it to the stormwater basin. And I did have uh, comments uh, from uh, the town engineer that I'd like to review uh, and go over uh, my my responses to them. Uh, number one, the Connecticut uh, DEEP general permit for the discharge of stormwater and dewatering wastewaters from the construction activities are required for sites with five acres or greater of disturbance. Uh, copies of this permit shall be provided to the town prior to construction. Uh, this is uh, actually a registration under a general permit that the, t that, uh, the state of Connecticut holds and uh, typically um, 60 days before the start of construction, you um, register under this general permit. And it's, uh, and what it is is uh, we prepare the permit and then typically what we also do is have a peer review where you have a, a second uh, licensed professional engineer review it uh, prior to submitting it uh, to the state. And um, uh, that's sort of a, a good system of checks and balances to make sure that uh, we, we um, meet uh, the 2004 water quality guidelines uh, and also the, uh, the 2002 uh, erosion and sedimentation control guidelines. This um, you know, stormwater registration uh, basically addresses erosion, sedimentation control, and stormwater quality during the construction process. Um, the applicant will be responsible for providing an erosion and sedimentation control bond to the town of Stonington in an amount approved by the town engineer after review of an estimate for all ENS measures. Um, absolutely, we concur with that as well. Uh, a vegetative cover uh, narrative uh, provide notes for temporary, permanent, and winter vegetative coverages to include seed type, application rates, schedules, and time periods for seeding. Uh, this is um, something that's uh, outlined very specifically in the 2002 um, ENS guidelines that the state has. Um, they've got uh, probably about 40 different seed mixes that they recommend for every different uh, situation that you might be um, utilizing, whether it be a stormwater basin, whether it be um, a temporary vegetative cover on stockpiles, or whether it's something you need to germinate quickly. Um, You've got this uh, great list of, of seed mixes uh, that we can take from and make sure that we select uh, the right seed mix. 
the archaeological uh, report recommends a 100-foot buffer e extending into Lot 6 to avoid any impacts uh, to undisturbed graves associated with the cemetery. Therefore, revise the plan illustrating proposed uh, improvements accordingly. Uh, what the archaeological report is referring to is there is a um, Mashantucket Pequot Cemetery uh, right at, just north of the site. And he says Lot 6. I'm assuming he means uh, Lot 18. Uh, these are all 6-18, 6-19. Um, currently, we are showing a septic system right here within within that 100 foot he, that he recommends. It's it's certainly not a problem. It, we're showing it there right now because that's where the test holes were located. Um, we've got plenty of room uh, on this lot uh, once uh, we go to develop this particular property to dig some additional test pits and and move that system 20 feet or so up gradient to meet that 100 foot buffer. Excuse me, you are willing to do that, to go to 100 foot buffer? Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, we've got plenty of room on, on the lot to do so. I don't think it impacts the development of the lot whatsoever. Thank you. Is there a stone wall or anything around the cemetery? Um, I don't believe there is. Uh, there, there are numerous stone walls throughout the site, which Mr. Mr. Brian, one of Mr. Brian's comments that I will get into afterwards. We'll get to that. Um, but... Um, the uh, you know the cemetery right now is just basically you know there is there is that buffer um, a portion of the open space actually goes uh, behind lot 618 in fact we've got uh, about uh, 78 feet of it there uh, and so this corner of the of the clearing and uh, and the proposed septic system does fall within that hundred feet. Um, Provide minimum offset distance from steamer valve to edge of road for the fire hydrant detail. Uh, that's on, I believe, sheet uh, 14 of the plans. We have uh, put that dimension on that detail. Um, sheet 7 of 16, revise the vertical curve. Uh, station uh, 2 plus 80.27 to meet the minimum roadway geometric intersection standards as outlined in Chapter 2 of the Town of Stonington Technical Standards. Um, we made that modification uh, to the uh, to the profile in order to meet that. Um, uh, sheet 13 of 16 in the development control plan uh, narrative replaced. There was a, a leftover note that said "Town of Killingly," uh, but we uh, we modified that uh, to "Town of Stonington." And additionally, note that the individual responsible for maintenance of ENS controls complete with contact phone number. Uh, that has been added to the plans as well. Provide vertical reference datum and benchmark on plans. Uh, that is on the existing condition plan. Uh, as far as the vertical datum goes, um, uh, this was is on the North American datum of 1983, which is NAD 83. Uh, typically, though, with, with benchmarks uh, and actually putting benchmarks uh, on the site. Uh, we usually usually refrain from doing that at this stage of the game because what happens is um, once once uh, the lots begin to be cleared and so forth and that we have a, a game plan as far as which lots will be developed first uh, then we can typically go in and set some vertical control at that point uh, that does not get disturbed and we can put it in areas uh, that, that aren't disturbed Uh, drainage comments it says any development resulting in actual disturbance of greater than one acre uh, should incorporate best management practices to meet the water quality volume and mitigate for stormwater runoff. Uh, furthermore, type one and type two best management practices shall be designed to mitigate 80% of the total suspended solids and floatables in accordance with the state MS4 permit in Connecticut 2004 stormwater quality manual as amended. Um, I believe uh, our uh, uh, design uh, does meet those um, as far as best management practices for um, low impact development. Um, as far as low impact goes, I think reducing this development from 21 lots to 10 lots uh, certainly helps in, in making this a much lower impact development. We're, we've really limited the amount of um, catch basins and piping here and wherever possible we're encouraging sheet flow as, as well. 
Um, he talks about the pre and post um, uh, development drainage in, uh, indicates proposed values exceeding the pre uh, the the pre construction runoff uh, values. Uh, modify the detention basin uh, design in accordance with section three one six two of the technical standards. Um, what we we did here, uh, what he's talking about, there are, there are two areas in particular. We've got some very slight increases in peak runoff flows to the open space area. Uh, I'm talking less than one CFS for all design storms. Uh, and we also have uh, some slight increases uh, on the north side of the road uh, to those, uh, to the, the four lots here, which would be a lot um, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. The overall amount of, of drainage uh, from these lots is slightly greater than um, pre-construction conditions. However, um, what we need to, each, each one of these lots individually is going to uh, be developed uh, based upon the house, based upon the amount of impervious that goes to the lot. Um, typically with these lots, we'll, we'll design rain gardens, we'll design landscape berms, um, infiltration practices for individual lots. Um, the um, my, the, the very, very small amount of, of increases that we're, um, that we're generating right now uh, can certainly be uh, mitigated uh, with, the, with the proper procedures as we develop each lot. Um, he also requested the pipe flow analysis. We did a, um, we did a, uh, a drainage report, a drainage study, uh, drainage design. Uh, and your town engineer just asked for the, uh, the individual pipe capacities, uh, which we can uh, certainly provide for that. Um, and then finally, um, uh, item number 13, revise the drainage discharge outlet to protect the existing intersection in accordance with section 3219 and 3210. Um, what he's talking about is the, the, finally, the final 40 feet or so of, of Kingfisher Way. What we have we have a cross slope that drains to a uh, a parabolic water quality swale here, but the the last 40 feet of the roadway, we don't have the opportunity to catch that. And uh, what your town engineer is suggesting is that we put some sort of a structure um, at the road here, and then discharge uh, back toward the wetlands. Uh, the problem with that. Um, Proposal is that there is a uh, there is an easement uh, at the at the uh, intersection of our road and Schoolhouse Road, uh, where there is a uh, a septic system that will be installed on that lot from a, from a neighboring property. That easement's already in place. It's been in place. Uh, it was put into place uh, a number of years ago. So that um, uh, apparently one of the neighboring properties is having some issues with their septic system and they don't have any place to put it. So. Um, we are um, granted uh, that easement to do that. Uh, I'm certainly willing to work with the town engineer to come up with an, with an alternative solution for that um, uh, because uh, installation of a pipe and basins there just isn't possible uh, due to that septic easement. And, and he uh, finishes his comments by saying, in review of the, the aforementioned application and plans, I recommended I recommend action be taken by the commission with the stipulation that the engineering comments be accomplished to the satisfaction and approval of the town engineer prior to construction. Um, and we certainly um, uh, don't object uh, to that statement. Now, I, I also have uh, statements by Mr. Brines uh, regarding uh, please clarify the location of the stone enclosure referred to in the archaeological report. Uh, that has been noted on the plan. It's, it's right in this corner of, uh, of the open space area, which is, uh, which is right here. Uh, that has been labeled and, and shown uh, thusly. So um, does it circle the cemetery? No. No, the cemetery, the cemetery we're talking about is actually off-site. It's, oh. it's up here. The, uh, the stone enclosure that was... Uh, that was um, brought up in the archaeological report is actually on the property right about here. Now, I, I know I didn't talk too much about the archaeological report, but uh, there was an extensive archaeological report prepared 
uh, for this project. Um, they did find um, a, a lot of like um, 18th and 19th century artifacts, you know, things like a button and pottery shards, uh, musket balls, things of that nature. Um, uh, so the recommendation was to keep um, that area uh, in conservation uh, and, and, and stay away from it, which is what we are doing. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, stone walls to be removed are labeled on the plans. Uh, that was another thing Mr. Brines brought up. He asked about what are we doing with the stone walls that are being removed. So uh, what we have, we, we are showing uh, a number of areas where the, where the stone walls have to be, be removed in order to develop the site. I did put sort of a, a, a note on the plan that says stone walls shown to be removed shall be utilized on site to provide boundary walls or landscaping features. Excuse me, what sheet are you referring to that has that notation? Am I missing one? I'm sorry? What, what sheet is that? That is, that is uh, sheet number three, but that's not going to be on your sheet because I just revised it after I got Mr. Bryant's comments. Ah. Okay. Okay. Well, I can't see it. That's why I can't see it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. My apologies. No problem. Yeah. These these were these were done on the fifteenth after I received uh, the comments and I was um, I discussed this with Mr. Brines, but he told me at the time that just to bring the plans to the meeting and discuss them because uh, he had already distributed the. We back. understand the process. But he, he had already fully, under, fully understood. Okay. So how many do you know? Do you have a rough estimate of stone wall? that you will save and stone walls that will be repurposed? Well, the re I'd, I'd, pro I'd say probably about half of them are going to be repurposed. They're, they're just, they don't really lay out in a manner that, that works for the lot layouts. They're, they're really sort of just very randomly uh, throughout the site. I mean, we have, we have some areas where we're trying to utilize them as best as possible, but um, they, they really don't make a lot of sense uh, when, you know, when looking at the lot layouts. They, it doesn't work. So, um, let me just, if I could just ask you about that process. Sure. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, let's say somebody comes along and they, they buy lot 6G and it has four stone walls. Aren't they going to dictate to you or the builder or the excavator where those stone walls should stay or or uh, be rebuilt or something? I mean, how can you make a statement well, saying I, I, this, saying that's, that? that's a good question. Yes. And I, I think um, what's kind of unique about this particular uh, subdivision is that um, all the homes are going to be built by the same builder. Uh, the, uh, there's um, a recommended architect that is going to be designing all the all the homes. Uh, a recommended landscape architect that is going to be doing all the landscaping. So, when someone comes here and decides what lot they'd like, well, yeah, I'd like I'd like my house built on this particular lot. Uh, the the uh, developer has a vision for this property of what he wants it to be. So, it's not going to be where the homeowner comes in and says, "Well, I want to get rid of these these walls, and I just want to sell them and get rid of them." Uh, He's just not going to be able to do that. There's going to be a very strict uh, criteria that uh, this development follows in order to make it um, uh, continuous, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, they, they, they really want this, these, these 10 homes uh, to be something where you go through it and, and they make sense with each other. You're not going to have 10 different t styles of housing and so forth there. And um, uh, so... As far as the walls go, I think I think that's probably the best answer I can give you. Okay. Um, please list maximum gross floor area of each building lot on the plans. Uh, that's actually on the uh, zoning table on sheet four. I, I added that uh, I added that maximum gross floor area onto the bottom of that table that was previously there. Yeah, and they're all pretty big anywhere from. Uh, is that also a change from the plans that we have? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, are there any special protections necessary for the cemetery adjacent to the proposed road? So that's a that's a second cemetery, which is right here. This this little this little square right here, about thirty five by thirty five feet. Um, we're not proposing any special protections. We're not encroaching on that cemetery. 
uh, the, the existing um, roadway, well, it's not exactly a roadway right now, it's a cart path uh, that comes off of um, Cormorant Road and, and makes its way across here. That, that uh, same footprint is going to be used for the roadway. Obviously, it's, it'll be a little more formalized uh, than what's there now. Uh, but uh, we don't anticipate uh, that it will have any impact on that cemetery. In fact, there are, there's a, a, you know, a section of stone wall that, that protects it from uh, any um, intrusion that we might uh, possibly do as, with the construction of the road. Uh, the application must demonstrate consideration of passive solar energy techniques and pos passive solar energy operations. Well, we did a, um, a shadow plan. I believe it's sheets 9 and 10. Where we, we show the house locations in the, in the shadows. So uh, what we try to do is to orient the long axis of the house to the south uh, to allow for, for solar access. And another thing, too, that I think is important is that these lots are big enough and we've got enough spaces between the, the, the lots so that if, if any of these houses wanted to uh, utilize like say some sort of passive solar energy uh, they wouldn't have to worry about the house next door to them blocking their 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 views or, or shading it uh, they'd have the ability to do that so um, you know based on you know that requirement um, like I said uh, we really try to show the long axis of the house in a southerly direction so that uh, we'd be able to take advantage of that. You won't stipulate into that, into the building instructions? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to do it that way anyway. No, I mean, it's just the way that the, the well, roads... My question is, are you going to request, require solar on the houses? I don't, I don't know if we're going to require it. I, I, I can't say for sure if that would be a requirement. Uh, but if it's uh, something that the Commission would encourage to be considered, then absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, flood hazard report uh, that Mr. Bryan's mentioned. Well, what we have here as far as flood hazard goes, we, we have uh, the, the special flood hazard area actually encompasses, um, I believe, seven of the lots. Portions, portions of lots uh, 13, 15, 16, and then 18 to 22. Uh, the special flood hazard. I'm gonna, let me move, I'm gonna flip back here. That's this, this, um, these, these sort of like circle lines here. So um, of the portions of those lots, I, I'm talking about lots, uh, these three here, 13, 15, 16, there's a portion of these lots, and then a portion of um, um, 18 to 22 as well. The only lot where the, the uh, potential house would, be, would fall within the special flood hazard is lot 622. Uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the lots, um, the special flood hazard is down toward the northern end of those of those lots, and uh, therefore uh, no no special consideration is required uh, because the um, the homes themselves are not falling within that special flood hazard. Uh, just that single lot, and we have shown it um, elevated to raise the uh, the floor level above that special flood hazard of, of eleven. And as Mr. Brines uh, also. Uh, mentions in his report, and uh, and I believe that um, it was it was also um, echoed in the in the report by the flood plain manager that um, uh, compensatory storage is not required because these are tidally influenced flood zones. Oh, so I have a copy of my written responses. And, uh, and also the um, sanitary report, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the flood hazard report. Um, as I said, the bulk of this proposed development does not fall within the flood hazard. Uh, portions of lots 13, 15, 16, 18, 22 
fall within the um, AE floods, flood hazard, but only lot 22 will require fill to raise the proposed structure. Um, the subdivision design is consistent with the need to minimize flood damage. Uh, the subdivision proposal has public utilities and facilities, uh, such as electrical and water, uh, located in construction to minimize flood damage. The subdivision proposal has adequate drainage provided to reduce exposure to flood hazards, uh, and the base flood elevation uh, is shown on the plans uh, as required. So I'd like to hand a copy of this in for the record. I think at this point, um, I'd be happy to entertain uh, any questions uh, the commission may have. Board, have any questions at this time? Yeah, I have uh, three questions. Uh, when the snow, uh, you know, you said that the engineer, town engineer, said that there was a problem with the water drainage and you can't really change the water drainage. Is that what the suggestion is because there's a right way to another lot? Mm -hmm. um, and you said that's fine. Back to the town engineer and come up with an agreed plan. Mm -hmm. uh, will that plan also go to the wetlands because there was a suggestion that it into the wetlands? No, he well, he said toward the wetlands. Um, I have we we have no activity within two hundred feet of the wetlands on, on this uh, on this particular project. And so I, I'm going to assume that the town engineer, whatever plan. Up with, it's not going to affect the wetlands, so you don't have to go to the wetlands. Then you want to put something in there saying that, you know, depending upon the plan, you might need to go back to wetlands. How does that work, Keith? I don't know the technical how that well, works. Well, that's a general rule anyway, where if they do something different within 100 feet of the wetlands, they'd have to go back to the wetlands commission. Okay. Um, I just to be sure. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. If Yeah, within 100 feet, for sure. Okay. Um, but we are. 225 feet. So. Uh, blasting? No blasting. I'm sorry? You're not going to need to blast or anything. Oh, no. Right. no. Okay. And uh, sidewalks. I see you asked for a waiver for the sidewalks. There aren't any sidewalks anywhere on, on Mason's Island. I know. Um, I mean, this is a new residential neighborhood. A lot of homes. Yeah. Well, I think. From my experience doing work uh, on Mason's Island, um, uh, with the amount of you know, traffic bumps and uh, calming uh, in the narrow roads and, and so forth, I, I see a lot of people walking along the sides of the roads all, all the time there. To think about. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Chuck? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, to the town engineer's drainage comments, um, specifically comment number 11, um, and I'm, I'm referring to the report that we have, um, and the comment talks about the pre and post uh, runoff calculations. Mm -hmm. um, I understood what you were saying that that um, the way you want to deal with this is to is to deal with this after the individual lot plans are developed. Right. But I think what the town engineer is saying is that from the standpoint of demonstrating your compliance with the regulations, yes. so that this subdivision can be reviewed and approved. Right. You have to demonstrate up front that you comply with it. Yeah, and I can so I can I think that's what the town engineer is saying right. here. So, exactly. So I think you're gonna to have to revise the calculations to show that that uh, in the current situation you know, you meet the, the uh, zero net increase requirements as they're stipulated in the regulations. Sure. Uh, other, other last question is, um, we talked about special flood hazard area. I think it's defined as elevation 11, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, is there any uh, LIMWA, any uh, limited wave action zones or anything? No. There, there is, okay. No. That was my only other question. Thank you. Yeah. Good You're presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Gary? Um, the way it was requested, landscape plan, prepared by a landscape architect. Right, because 
each, each individual lot is going to be landscaped individually when, when it's developed. So there's, there's really no sense in what will happen is the road will be constructed. And, you know, other than, you know, possibly maybe putting in a few street trees, uh, each lot itself is going to be, you know, landscape. Uh, and, I, and I can tell you, having worked with a developer uh, on a lot of his projects over the past 10 years, that um, these, will, these will be beautiful homes and, and beautiful lots. And the um, roadway lighting, no roadway lighting? No, this is not no. once again, there's, there's no, and I think, uh, you know, from the perspective of the people uh, that, that live on Mason's Island, they really like the, the dark sky, um, and if we can not put up street lights and, you know, just have people kind of continue with uh, the way that things have been out there, um, it, it'll be a lot more uh, uh, amenable for, for the people. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I need a little clarification on that drainage to the north from the proposed Kingfisher Way. I'm a little confused. Is that just a sway, a uh, reverse sway? I mean, is it a drainage ditch here, or is it a pipe? There's actually a pipe in there. There's a. Uh, it's, it's just it's not drawn drawn in on the pl on this plan. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm showing it on. It should be on. Uh, if you look on sheet four of the plans. Okay, there it is. Yep. And where is that going? It go. It goes to the stormwater basin uh, that we discussed. Uh, that was that was constructed as as uh, part of the first phase of this development. Which is not shown. The basin is not shown. Ah, it's. I can. I can show road? you the overall. Hang on. Is the basin on the town road? From the north. On the north road. Yeah. The basin's. Uh, the basin is is off of North Road. Okay. It was built in a previous phase, right? Correct, correct. Who owns the basin now? The uh, Mason Homestead Homeowners Association. Ah, okay, there it and, is. and you have the right to discharge into it? Yes, we do. Okay. And it's built for the 22 lot subdivision, so it's big enough for the lot. Right. And then last question. Um, well, no, I have a couple more. Open space. Um, who, who will take on the responsibility of the open space? Um, that was a that's a good question. I think I I think the best um, um, or well entity to to take over that open space would be the homeowners association. Uh, number oh. number one, because uh, there's going to have to be uh, an invasive species management plan there, mm -hmm. and then secondly because there's a, a septic system in it as well. So I'm not sure if the town wants to take acquisition of that with with those encumbrances on it. Okay. So would that be deeded? Would that be specified and deeded? So yeah. When deeded. when the when the association documents are drawn up, uh, the, the the all of the uh, the specifics about maintaining it and, and stewardship of it and so forth will be included in that. Make a stipulation. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. At this time, I'd like to see what's on the sign-up sheet and open the floor to the public. Do you have any uh, comments in favor, opposed, or general comments? Newman? No. Nauman? Yeah. Please. I've got uh, two questions um, for the gentleman. The first one is, could you expand on the septic system that is in the open space? What is the purpose of that? And doesn't that kind of violate the concept of an open space to have it undermined with a septic system? What house is being provided with a septic service? 
it seems kind of outside the scope of this whole project that's being developed. So I think it'd be worthwhile knowing what what's encompassed there, what, what's going on. The second one is what engineering or regulatory requirement is there for the, the, uh, the new road to connect with Schoolhouse. Schoolhouse is part of a private association and this would be a second way into the private association that there's a big gatehouse there People live there, spend a lot of money for a guy in the gatehouse. This would kind of neutralize all that. So the question is, why is there a need to connect to Schoolhouse as opposed to just go out through the other road? Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to, might as well do it individually. Um, as, as far as the, uh, the septic system and the open space, um, that, was, that area was deeded a long time ago. Um, it, it just happens to be there. Um, I think uh, Mr. Brines um, mentioned in his write-up that there is um, uh, nothing in the regulations that prevents a septic system from being in the open space. Um, so it's just uh, you know, something that's there that we have to deal with. Um, as far as um, the, uh, the roadway going through uh, from Cormorant to Schoolhouse Road, um, from a, uh, a fire accessibility point, uh, the, you know, the, um, it, it certainly makes a lot of sense to, to provide you know, pass-through uh, traffic uh, in, in the case of emergency vehicles and so forth. Um, the original design that was uh, back in 2004 had the road in this configuration as well. Um, so um, you know, we um, essentially mimicked uh, that roadway design, seeing it had been approved before. Uh, we just felt that those, it was the uh, easiest uh, route to go uh, since it had been approved previously. So can I just ask you, before you sit down, and since we're, we're answering the gentleman's comments, what is the septic system that's on the open, it, that's in the open space, is it active? It's, it's, not, even, it's not there. It's not the there. There is no, there is no septic system there oh. currently. It's just an easement to construct that septic system when it's needed. Yeah. For a house that's already constructed? Yes. Okay. Yes. And in, in the easement, does it I'm, say? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I, can, I can perhaps uh, speak to the owner. Excuse me, can you yeah. talk, yeah. use the microphone? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah what would, what, um, no, wait, uh, excuse me, hold on, sir. Lynn, were you all done with your question? No, I, no. I, I wanted to just so, pursue hold it. Hold on. We'll refrain from the audience for the moment. You just can't interject in the middle of someone else's question, to be fair. Thank you. So Lynn, continue. Um, so I just wondered when, when and if the septic system is built to go along with a home that's outside the 11 lot subdivision, um, would and and that subdivision takes ownership of maintenance of the open space and therefore the septic system would it would it stipulate that it has to be pumped out every so many years and that the subdivision pays for it no the subdivision uh, would not pay for it it would it would be the responsibility of the homeowner who is constructing uh, oh. the system and I think with as with any other septic system it, it should be maintained on a regular basis the the um, health department has uh, in the health code have recommendations for for oh, I thought you said um, that when we talked about the open space and who would take ownership of the open space and I might have misinterpreted what you said but I thought you kind of indicated that you felt the best place was for this homeowners association to go ahead and take ownership and maintain it, which I would assume would be anything on it, in it, below it. No, I, and I mean, if I wasn't clear, I apologize. Uh -huh. It would be for basically the maintenance of, of the open space itself, uh, invasives management, uh, mowing, uh, anything of that nature. Surface only. Yeah. Pardon me? Surface only. 
correct. Well, it's an easement, it's an actually, easement. what he's saying okay. is, in, 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 so it, it, must is, say it is pretty clear, there's an easement that gives yeah. some third party the right to build a septic yeah. system in there. Yeah. So, so that under that easement, that party that builds it is responsible for it in the future. Okay. So, right. you know, it, it, the demarcation is pretty clear. Right. The, the open space uh, maintenance activities would be X. The subsurface leaching facility maintenance activities would belong to that party who owned the maintenance, who owned the easement. That's so, correct. So okay. it's it's, uh, it's on the land records and yeah. it's probably pretty. Yeah, it was okay. on the land. And, and the, there are good question. Yeah. And there are actually there are actually two separate easements there. Uh, one of them. One of them is uh, for the system itself, and the other one is a temporary easement to construct it because they, they assume that you know the footprint for the easement, the, the footprint for the con for uh, you know building that system is going to be larger than the system itself. Okay. So there's a temporary easement in place for access to it. Okay, so that's a whole separate matter. Correct. Then um, the other follow-up question to the public comment having to do with the road going into a private uh, community. Did you go back uh, since the 22 lot subdivision expired and wasn't registered? Did you go back to whatever that private community government is and say, okay, we're, we're doing this just as we had, um, had been agreed X number of years ago? Um, no, oh. I, we did not. We did not. So, is and your thought all, process all these, it would just be an open road? Yeah. Well, it's going to be. It's going to be owned and maintained. It's a private road. That'll be. That will be um, utilized uh, and, and maintained by uh, the homeowners association. That'll be part of this development. But the. Okay. I mean, I think. You know, everyone has the right to access the roads throughout the island. It's, you know, I, I mean, there's a separate homeowners association on Cormorant Road, mm -hmm. and that's going to terminate in uh, where where uh, Kingfisher Way is going to start. There's there's a homeowners association there that's not part of this association, and I don't know how many different uh, associations there are on the island, but I'm I'm sure there are a number of them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Also, yeah. just a just a clarification. Um, since the roads are owned by the individual homeowners association, mm -hmm. uh, is it is it established anywhere that there are mutual rights on the part of all homeowners across all the roads? I don't know the answer. I mean, to you that. are connecting these right. roads, and, and right? It's, Me. it's understood that that's the case. I I would think so. I've driven I, out there myself. I I, I because. You know, I you know if if every road here or every dozen houses or twenty houses has a separate homeowners association, they they certainly have to traverse over other roads to get to their homes. Right. So maybe if it's not written somewhere, it's it's just an assumed right to be able to get to your property. But you know. And again, I don't want to make any assumptions here, but there is a gatehouse mm -hmm. um, as part of a community within Mason's Island. Correct. And that gatehouse supposedly uh, monitors and may limit mm -hmm. access to a private road. Right. So my understanding from the comment is that now, that's and that's the only way, that's the only road with the gatehouse to get into that part of that community. Correct. So with this subdivision, there's going to be another house or another road to access to kind of bypass the gatehouse. So to oh, say. actually, no. You have to. You actually have to go through the gatehouse to yeah. to get there. To get to Kingfisher. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. You have that to wasn't go. Clear. The next the next road after that is Cormorant. Uh -huh. After the gatehouse, you you you, ride, you go to the right on Cormorant, and then. And then schoolhouse is the, is the next one after that. So you so do have to actually oh, okay. go through the gatehouse to, to get there. Well, I hope you have an agreement then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know, you know, I, I don't live there, but, you know, I go there to working on projects, and I just yeah. tell the gentleman at the gatehouse I'm, I'm going to schoolhouse road to dig some test pits. He says, okay, go ahead. Okay. I, you know, okay. Does the town plow the roads? I don't know. 
No. Is that a town hall road? No. No. All private. Thank you. So now, do you want to follow up, Mr. Newman? Now, yes. uh, come on up to my. <clears throat> so, as far as I understand it, if this is approved, as is with the request for the septic, then a septic system will be built there for a house that is unidentified, may or may not exist, as far as we know on a piece of property that is green space, right? And as far as I can tell, I can't see a house on that property that is supposed to be the green space that would normally be considered the house for the septic system. So conceivably, we're talking about piping waste around Mason's Island to get to this septic system. So far, we haven't really had any answers, as far as I can tell, on the house, where it is, how the sewage is going to go to this system, and if this is approved as requested, it's just there's an approval right for that system. So I think it's really incumbent on this committee to understand what is being requested with respect to that system. Yeah, I think the, I have a different understanding. Mr. Engineer, I, I can't remember your name. Could you clarify that? Is the house existing already? Yes. Can please step Could up? Can point out yeah. with the house the location? I, I, I don't know exactly where that house is. Could, could yeah, yes, yes. And who, and who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Peter Giordano. I own Prominent Development, who will be building all the homes in this subdivision. Uh, there is a, a easement right now for can, that septic system yeah. that is further down. The house location is further down yeah. on Schoolhouse Road, mm -hmm. quite a bit down the you know, direction. There will be a house built there eventually. It will be a high-pressure pumping system for from that house that will go travel all the way up the road. Underneath, to this underneath school underneath the schoolhouse road to that location and it's all been approved what lands everything's been approved for that lot and it currently like that is easement. not built at this yeah. point okay. and ledge light ledge light has reviewed that system absolutely okay. okay so the authority to answer your question the authority for septic systems is not is not this commission the authority for septic systems is ledge light the health district so they review and approve these things so this, this was all reviewed and approved in advance. It could happen tomorrow under these plans that That's are already, already approved. The actual all design. All the easements exist to, to build this tomorrow. So Whether you have the subdivision exists. or not. Right. right. Correct. That, that's Whether correct. the subdivision that's happens correct. or not. Totally independent. That's so, correct. So, so, and it's not, it's not so peculiar, so, sir. Who is doing all this? I do not know the property owner. It is not being built currently. All I know that there's an easement and it's been approved by ledge light in that a septic system could go there. The final design will be based upon the actual building of the house. Right. The and thing that makes it unusual, and I don't disagree with you, is that now the subdivision is approved and you overlay the subdivision on this, and it is kind of a peculiar thing that it ends up being That's an correct. open space. So and you know that part of it, that part of it, you know, is just an emerging issue, but but uh, it wasn't designed that way to begin with. It, it sort of happened, you know, because the two activities are overlaid on one another. That's correct. That's, that's the way this took place, at least mm -hmm. based on my understanding of the fact. Thank you for the clarity. The plans say that the easement is in favor of Shonda Shekhar, Nike, Nike. Uh, I'm not sure where exactly their property is, but that they're the ones uh, who the easement's in favor of. The property, just so people understand, is 28 school house. It's probably about 1,000 feet of sewage pumping around the island. Thank you. Moving along, uh, Keith Gove. <coughs> Hello, I'm representing the Master Tucker Tribe. And I want clarification on what you said that Brian said about the distances I was looking for. Oh, what clarification on what Kevin McBride said about the distances from the cemetery. And does the project have a, I keep forgetting the word, but a, an unanticipated discovery plan written in case more uh, 
you know, ancestors are found there. So we would like something in place that uh, the developer recognizes that he's tearing up bones and he stops and he calls people. We have one that we can give to the developer and he just has to fill it in. We'd like that put into the permit if issued. Thank you. It's a very relevant point. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Kathy Marco. Hi, I'm Kathy. I live at 23 Skiff Lane, so I'm within the Mason's Island Fire District, and I used to serve as the president of the Homeowners Association. And I, I thought the presentation was great, but I have a couple of questions. I don't know if I do it by piecemeal, because probably there's five questions. <laughs> um, one of them, I just was curious, are the utilities underground for this new section? Yes. Yes, okay, yes. Um, also, the question is, how many lots are going to be in the Mason's Island Fire District versus outside the Mason's Island Fire District? Good question. When you were talking about the association, I think there were one, I don't recall, Rufus did a nice presentation at our annual meeting, and I don't recall how many lots were going to be of this thing in the Mason's Island Fire District versus the other association, or Mason's Island property owners. And both of them have, at least we have a tax structure that takes care of plowing our roads and doing all kinds of things. I'm not really sure about the other association. I, I'm ignorant about that, but um, if you have this contiguous road that's going to go from one to the other, what, do they stop plowing at a certain spot? I mean, I'm just kind of curious. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the fire district. We have Hoxie that we have contracted. I'm not sure if the other one's Hoxie or not. So that's the kind of thing. The other question was, uh, in the presentation they were talking about the high point on Kingfisher, and one part of it drained to the basin, and then the conversation went, the other part drains to schoolhouse, and we'll talk about it later. But I, didn't, I must have ignored where the other part is on going to schoolhouse. And I think that some of the people that knew I was coming tonight would like to know, where is it draining on schoolhouse? Because that's within the Mason's Island Fire District. Okay. Okay. We'll find, okay? Out. We'll find out. Thank you. Mr. Engineer? Yes. I can, I can answer that. Refresh um, my memory, your name, please. Norm Tebow. Norm, thank you. Not a problem. Embarrassed. Um, Mr. Engineer. Yes, underground utilities, yes. Um, obviously, you answered that question. Uh, the number of lots in the Mason's Island Fire District, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if any of the other gentlemen that are here with me uh, this evening know the answer to that, but off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, Regarding the high point on Kingfisher and the drainage, okay. I, I did talk about it, but I'll, I'll clarify. Okay, why not going to schoolhouse? Yeah. So, the end... Uh, so, we've got a high point right here. And so, this, this portion of the roadway drains back toward, toward Schoolhouse Road. What we've done is we've cross-sloped the road, so even though it's coming here, it drains to a, it's draining to this swale on side of the road. And the, 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 the only question by the town engineer is, you know, what happens to this last, like, 40 feet of the road or so? Because you've got about 40 feet of it that we can't capture. So we've, we've, got, the, we've got about 40 feet of pavement that's draining out onto Schoolhouse Road and uh, that, that I haven't uh, accounted for. And that's something that... The, the town engineer suggested possibly, you know, putting in uh, some sort of a stormwater collection system um, at the road here and then piping it into the open space. Uh, the problem with that is that the pipe would have to go through the septic easement, and health code does not allow that. So that's kind of the conundrum uh, that we have right now. Um, you know, I think, you know, the 40 feet of pavement or so that's draining out, uh, I think it's very, very inconsequential. Um, I am going to discuss it with the town engineer uh, to see whether uh, potential um, um, solutions he may have. I mean, since it is such a small area here, uh, it's very possible that we could put a couple of drywalls there and, and, and infiltrate that, that little bit of water to keep it from getting to the road. Uh, but uh, that's, a, that's an item that uh, he and I need to discuss. Okay, I was just kind of curious because I know it's too kind of 
kind of spaces to land things in my mind. There were for discussion with the property owners, and I didn't know if that would happen in any way. I don't believe it will. I don't believe it will. And lastly, I can't quite read the signature, but the person from 3 Mallard Road. You have to state your name. It's me. Okay. I'm Amy Estabrook. Amy. And I'm a relatively new resident at, on Mason's Island. Uh, I've never attended a planning and zoning meeting before. Uh, so forgive my, <laughs> forgive my ignorance, and i got to say, it's been very enlightening and wonderful to learn, and that's what I came here for tonight, was to learn what's going on, because it's all been sort of masked in secrecy. Um, I don't know if what I had prepared to say tonight is appropriate for the occasion, because what I'm, you know, I mean, what I've learned tonight is, is, is very helpful to, you know, get down to the nuts and bolts of, of what the physical impact could be on this land. I'm more um, concerned um, with the, the the spatial, the the beautification, you know, the beauty being destroyed. Um, so should I say this or should I not? I don't think. <laughs> it's up to you. I mean, does it, does it, you know, I don't know if it has any bearing. I don't it's know a public hearing. You can yeah. say, what, you can yeah. say yeah. what's on your mind. All right. I'll say yes. what's on my mind, and that's why I came. Because I thought if, you know, one of the reasons. Because if I don't speak up when there's a chance, and I've never done this before. So my only request <laughs> is to use the mi microphone a little okay. bit more closely. Uh, this parcel of land is contiguous to the home I purchased almost two years ago. I'd moved to Mason's Island two years prior to that to see if it would be a place I'd like to settle and begin a new life. I ultimately chose to purchase my home here for four important reasons. The natural beauty, the safety, privacy, and the close caring community. The people who lived on this island for a number of years who have lived on this island for a number of years, share a common appreciation for and deeply value the undeveloped nature of the island. The land under scrutiny is a deciduous forest chock full of wildlife adjacent to my backyard. This undeveloped space provides peace and quiet not only for me but for all the residents of the north end of the island. It offers up only the soothing sounds of nature, rustling leaves, bird song. Uh, it provides nighttime darkness, a home for deer, fox, squirrels, a vast number of bird species, as well as a lovely grassy trail for walking. The dog, dogs particularly appreciate this feature. As a newly single senior citizen, it was important to me to feel safe living here. Uh, the limited density and trail allows residents to the ability to walk the island without feeling threatened by traffic. The proposed development will create a new traffic route that eliminates this trail. In the four years I've been living here, the sounds of construction have gradually increased to the point where, for the last year at least, it is now a daily occurrence. This noise of backing up beeping trucks, blasting, boulders dropping, backhoes digging, has become incessant. If this proposed development moves forward, the community will be subjected uh, to this horrid din for years to come. Sadly, the vast amount of de development that has occurred over the island in the last few years has already begun to negatively impact the peaceful, safe feeling of the place. Further development will simply destroy the zeitgeist of my Mason's Island's homeowner community, homeowner's community. Um, to Rufus Allen, I'd like to say, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, this land was given to you. It wasn't earned. This gift thus came, came with both the responsibility to care for it and the community to which it is a part of. Not just for today, but for its future. With it, you were also given the power to affect positive or negative change. 
to not just the land, but to the lives of each and every person, animal, and bird that resides in this community. And not to just the current residents living on Schoolhouse Road, but every future re resident that will be directly, directly affected by your choice. When considering how to manage this asset, I implore you to consider or reconsider donating this 17-acre parcel to my POA, which is Mason's Island Property Owners Association, as protected land to ensure the well-being of both the island itself, its residents, human and animal, in perpetuity. You have been empowered with a choice. Your legacy can be that of a hero, a protector of this land and this community, or the antithesis of that. Which legacy will you choose? To the Planning and Zoning Council, um, I implore you to exercise whatever power you may, ha may ha control to prohibit this development from happening. The quality of life currently provided to the residents of Mason's Island will be permanently destroyed if this development is to occur. Developing this land will displace wildlife, create noise pollution from people, their lawn equipment, their cars, create light pollution, adversely affecting both humans and the wildlife that may remain, increase traffic on the roads and decrease safety, increase demand of the water supply, increase waste and litter. Mostly, it will hurt the integrity of what makes this island so special. And that's all I have to say. And forgive me if it's not. It's how I feel. Fine. Thank you very much. So, thank, you. thank you for your comments. Thank you. thank you. Any final rebuttal, Norm? <clears throat> no, um, I, I mean, I, I mean, I certainly appreciate the concerns. Um, I think, I think. Um, you know, as as developers, they've they've really taken a lot of things into consideration by reducing the number of lots, and um, and I'm sure I don't have to remind this commission that subdivisions uh, are considered an as of right use, and if we do meet the subdivision and zoning regulations, um, you know that that is the uh, criteria in which you have to consider this application. So, um, uh, I think by Putting nearly four and a half acres into open space and, and limiting the, the amount of disturbances on these rather large lots, um, we'll be able to preserve a, a, a lot of the um, elements uh, of the site that people are concerned about possibly losing. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Staff report. There's a gentleman in the audience. Oh, the gentleman in the rear. If you could just come up and state your name. That's okay, just state your name. You can state your name on the microphone and after. My name is Rufus Allen, Mason's Allen Company. I hadn't planned on speaking tonight, but I wanted to mention a couple of things to the commission. We set aside, and irrespective of the planning and zoning regulations, in other words, we weren't required to do this as part of the subdivision. We set aside 47 acres in the center of the island, which will be permanently protected by the Nature Conservancy. It's because I spent my whole life, 80 years on Mason's Island, and this morning we had seven deer romping through our yard. And you know, when I when I hear people who have a minimum size, a substandard size lot, worried about this proposal, I get a little upset. You know, we did get the approval for the 21 lots. I probably wouldn't have come in with 10 lots, but I know the builder is has a very good reputation. He's built a lot of good houses on Cormorant Road. And when he, when I was approached that he wanted to buy it or work with the buyers, and we're only going to put in 10 lots, I thought, what better could we have 
on Mason's Island with acre lots. Whereas some of the lots that we have from the old days are only 10,000 square feet. So I, I think, you know, to, to criticize this and worry about the birds and the bees, all you have to do is come down and walk the black duck road and you got 47 acres of wetlands, inland wetlands, marsh, forest, and there are, as I said, lots of animals running around. And I, I just, I'm very, you know, from when my grandfather started this, they, it was back in the old days, Florida land development. Some of the lots were less than 10,000 square feet. And he said, what I was brothers and said, no, we're going to make it larger and larger and larger. And these are far larger lots than what the town requires. And I, and I just, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Staff? Well, as, as Mr. Tebow pointed out, subdivisions are an as of right exercise by state law. Where basically if someone proposes a subdivision and it meets the regulations, both the zoning and the subdivision regulations, um, it needs to be approved. That said, there are a lot, a lot of details in the subdivision regulations, especially about progress and things to be shown on the plan. Um, You know, a lot of it comes back to the town engineer's comments. I think the bottom line is, you know, the town engineer said that he needed more information to determine whether the basin can handle the runoff and, you know, whether it'll be neg negative impacts to the property down the slope to the north on Old North Road. Um, the 2004 plan included a swale to the north of the houses the channels stormwater to the east to the plan basin where the plan now doesn't have the swale but it has a buffer of existing vegetation so it's sort of a trade-off if you build a swale there you're cutting down the trees to uh, to build the swale um, then whether that's needed is something that uh, the town engineer can review when he looks at the revised plans um, this is also a CAM application, Coastal Area Management. Um, so this was referred to DEP for their comment, um, which they really didn't have anything negative to say about it. Um, as was mentioned, uh, only one of the houses will be actually built in the floodplain. Um, so the plans show it being elevated uh, to be out of the, to be above the base flood elevation and the plan is for them to request a uh, Loma letter of map amendment to FEMA to remove that property from the uh, from the flood district once that's done. Now we talked about the archaeological study and where the resources are which seem to be in the open space. Um, Again, the applicants have talked about increasing that buffer from the burial ground and all North Road to 100 feet, as was recommended in that plan. And we have some draft recommended stipulations for this if the commission approves it, which um, I think I'll go through now just to get those out in the open here. Uh, number one is that the final plan shall be reviewed to the satisfaction of the town engineer. Number two, final plan shall include new street address and assessor's lot numbers as assigned by the town. Uh, number three is to provide the AutoCAD drawing of the lots or to provide a fee in lieu of that drawing. Uh, number four is that the open space transfer and drainage easement shall be recorded with the final plans. 
Number five is uh, language ins about installing boundary markers for the lots. And number six, um, posting the erosion and sedimentation control bond. I'd like to add two more if we can, with the board's concurrence. Um, I appreciated the National Tucket representative with the plan for digging surprises. Yeah, the unanticipated Unanticipated. Discovery. Yep. Um, I think that should be included. Agreed. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Chuck? Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you. And then um, I'd like so, in writing the keeping 100 feet from the uh, burial ground, any kind of construction. Agreed. Is that amenable? Um, yes. Absolutely. It was more than keeping away from it. I think it, my understanding was that the boundary of the open space parcel would be moved down. Maybe I misunderstood I that. I thought it was the septic system was 73 feet away from the burial ground on lot. Well, they were going to move it. They, they were wanted a buffer move. around right. the That's cemetery. Right. That's right. what I'm talking about. Yeah. About six yeah, so eight. maybe yeah. yeah, maybe we can get clarification from them with, were we talking about moving the boundary of the open space parcel or just moving the septic system? Uh, I, can, uh, I can clarify that, Norm Tebow, for the record. Uh, that would just be moving the septic system, not, okay. not the That's boundary of the open space. A lot, uh, 619? 618? 18. 18. 18. Okay. That was it for my... So, so, I mean, my recommendation was, you know, we can go through all this, but that you know, to ultimately continue the hearing to to give them a chance to address some of those uh, drainage issues. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. agreed. Any other comments, questions? I, I, what, what do people think about the sidewalks? I th he requested a waiver for the sidewalks. Am I... Think about sidewalks for the continuation could of the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, could we do? I remember Chuck on one of the previous part. We we made a simple for an easement for a sidewalk to be built. Would they agree to that? Hmm. As opposed to having them build one. So I remember we did that on another project as a compromise. Well, why would we need the no, no worries. I'm just. <laughs> uh, it's a private road, right. so. It's not a matter of an easement. They have to build, right. actually build them, right? right? So the town's never going to come in and build them. Right. Whereas what that's what happened. Uh, right. you know, I just wonder if yeah. we force one, then we have to be, you know. We have to we start to somewhere. I just think it's yeah. it's a discussion point that we maybe want to take up either now or. I would say yeah. continue with our other items. We'll be talking about yeah. next meeting next time yeah. we open them. So are we talking about tabling this to give them a chance to work with the town engineer on the on the drainage items, or are we talking about a conditional approval? To keep it open. Keep it open. Keep it open. Please. Do we need to make a motion to Please. This? Make a motion so, to uh, keep this uh, hearing open until uh, the next scheduled session. Up to Keith's discretion. Yep. And is the next, is that enough time, September 6th, the next meeting? Yes. Until September 6th. Yeah. Okay. So here, thank you, uh, Ryan. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Chuck. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion to close the public Aye. hearing. Second. Well, the, the public hearing is still open, but oh, so the, I'm make a motion. Tonight's meeting. I take that okay. back. Make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Any further Aye. discussion? Aye. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.